Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll be discussing living history museums and museum programs that take visitors back in time. Our guests today are Peter Armstrong, President and CEO of the Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut, which was founded in 1929. Norman Burns, President and CEO of the Connor Prairie Museum in Indiana, which traces its origins back to the mid-1930s. And Raymond Ashley, President and CEO of the Maritime Museum of San Diego, the young kid on the block, which was established in 1984, uh, 1948. So thank you all for joining us. It's just wonderful to have you here to talk about American history and how we present. And I, I love the fact that we, w- we were able to put together a show that includes um, the, the two coasts and uh, Norman, you you and the Senate to bind us all together. Uh, so let's let's uh, start off and and let's start off on the we're going to go from uh, the east coast to the to the west coast, right? Sun rises, we'll follow the sun. So if you if you look at at learning about history, and there's a big big discussion right now about uh, teaching history, about critical race theory, about different perspectives. Um, let's talk uh, about the uh, the idea of the meaning of a living history museum and how that actually functions, uh, starting with you, Peter. Um, how does the uh, Mystic Seaport function in Connecticut to bring a sense of that era uh, to Americans who visit, to visitors, to your state, and give them a, a real sense that they wouldn't get in a classroom setting, or they would not get it in a uh, in a uh, museum that that functions simply as a building where you enter in and you walk through rooms, room after room after room. Let's just widen the question a little bit and say sort of what's the point of museums in the first place today in 2021? You know, so if you look at the fact that I can pick up my phone and Google anything I want to Google and find out any facts I want to find out, I think what living history museums give or history museums in general is that they uh, have a place where you can experience something together as a family you can have some memories of that. Now, sometimes those living history museums are in places that are specifically tied into a uh, a historical period. So Colonial Williamsburg, Jamestown, Yorktown, those ones that are attached to where the things took place. And then some of them like Mystic Seaport uh, wasn't an an actual seaport and then, uh, you know, built ships and it had a history to it as well. So you're actually in the place. So, you know, if you imagine if you go to the Met in New York, uh, that's a, with lots of objects, incredible things in there, but it's not the place it happened. So one of the things that the history museums and living history museums in particular can do is send to you in where the action was and then give you an opportunity to have experiences as a group rather than say, well, you know, I want to know when, from my point of view, James, at uh, Mystic Seaport, uh, then we have the, the Charles W. Morgan uh, whaling ship, you know, and I might want to know how many people went on that whaling ship. Well, I can Google that. But what I can't do is go on it with my family and learn from it as an experience. So that's what makes a difference. So it's the three dimension dimensionality of it. It's it's the environment of it. It's it's Good. walking outside and feeling the sunshine or feeling the the, the the drizzle when it rains. It's it's that whole idea of interacting with people, right, Norman? I mean, when you walk into the uh, the uh, Connor Prairie facility. It's immersive in a way that you cannot get on one of these little devices, right? And and you can't even get that kind of immersion in history uh, when you're walking through rooms rooms where there are objects uh, simply stacked up. That's right. I think places like Connor Prairie, you know, we pretty much engage all the senses. And I think that's what any good museum does, even those that are confined by four walls. Uh, outdoor living history museums, we have the benefit that you really engage the five senses. You're you're in, you you do feel the sun on your face and you do have the breeze and all those things. And you even get to have some of the same smells that you might've experienced hundreds of years ago, whether it's open heart cooking or, you know, the farm animals or the the breeze from the sea that's on your face uh, and those types of things. So that's what we bring to the table is we have those authentic uh, open experiences. And I do think that that's one thing that any history museum or living history uh, museum brings to the table is that we can research and have authentic experiences for our guests. Some people might argue that a a first person living history site cannot be truly authentic because we can't speak for that either historic character or or a composite character. However, we do give the public a way to engage 
and experience history in ways that they don't. Our founder, uh, Eli Lilly, who purchased uh, this historic place uh, in the 1930s, he, he wanted to preserve history and teach it in a way that history books cannot. And so that's really been at the core of what Connor Perry has done ever since Eli Lilly started the preservation project back in the 1930s, basing it upon what John D. Rockefeller was doing in Williamsburg. He wanted to teach history in a way that books cannot. And he did that not only through a history site, but also through the natural setting that we have and through agricultural experiences. This was a farm uh, for nearly four decades, a, a working farm, and it still is with the heritage breeds that we have. You know, it, and one of the things that I find to, uh, that is really interesting from uh, when I visit facilities all across the country, and I visit a lot of museums, you can imagine. So when I when I uh, go to Mystic Seaport, one of the things that I was taken with is the music, right? The old sea shanties. I have I have uh, CD collections from uh, that era, and, and Mystic Seaport really uh, focuses on that sort of traditional uh, tall ships era. Um, uh, Raymond, it, it, in San Diego, you have that, but you were founded right after the Second World War. And, and so the, the, the shift in, in consciousness that these two uh, organizations represented is just so fascinating to me. Oh, great. Well, well first of all, uh, I, I do need to make a slight correction. We were actually founded in 1927. So it was about oh. 21 years earlier than that, since we are talking about history after all. We were incorporated in 1948, and that's why that, that date comes up. But um, uh, in response to your question, and, and actually to, to some of the really great re uh, comments that have made thus far, I think one of the things that separates uh, institutions, like the ones you have on the show today as living history museums, is they're, they're entirely different from the way we experience history as it's taught the first time we ever go to a history class, all the way through academia, because if you strip it away, history is really the search for cause, isn't it? The explanation for why things happen. And, the, and, and the, the consequence of that is once you've explained why something happened in a certain way, you've also inadvertently explained why it couldn't have happened any other way. Mm -hmm. So as it's incorporated and digested, there's a sense of inevitability to it, that we're all just captive you know, actors in a script that's already been written, because that's how it seems. And that's true for movies, it's true for historical fiction and novels. They all have a theme or a narrative that more or less explains things. But that's not really the way we experience life. We don't really know how the story turns out. And we'd like to, but we don't. So I think what a living history museum can do is it can take you back to a specific moment in time, a specific place, and it can strip away that sense of inevitability that, that we've all inculcated, you know, and that that it gives a sense of understanding that we do have control of our own lives, our own destinies, and that history is something yet to be made, at least from our perspective. And that is a way to experience it and see it the way people in the past did, because of course they didn't know the way the story ended and the way things turned out. Well, I also love the fact that you corrected um, my assertion that you were founded in 48 and you added texture to that. I mean, that is it's, it's really a tiny little thing, but, but you've given me a, a different way of thinking now, right? You didn't say I was wrong. You just said I was incomplete, right? Here's some additional fact. Rethink, Mark, how you look at these museums. And, and as a matter of fact, after the show, I'm going to go back. I'm going to take another look at your programs because the era in which one is founded and the attitudes that, that um, one thinks uh, the founders had um, d does affect the interpretation. So let's talk a little bit about interpretation. And Raymond, staying with you, how do you look at, at historical uh, interpretation? Because there's so many viewpoints. There's so many different ethnicities that were part of the founding of this country. There's so many different um, uh, ways of being that, that our founders through the generations have had. Um, how do you present um, the, the texture of of um, maritime history uh, through your facility uh, in San Diego? Um, well, certainly um, one of the things that is different, I think about our institution is it's not the attempt to recreate one moment in time. We have 11 different ships. Each of them is a complete world unto itself and each one is it's a representative of its own world in microcosm, if you will. So you can actually proceed through a sequence of experiences arranged chronologically. But having said that, I think one of the things about maritime endeavor is that it's probably it's it's from the beginning it was it, it was one of the most diverse activities that Americans engaged in 
and it brought people from all cultures together. That was true of, of Atlantic seafaring. It was certainly true of the Pacific as well from the very beginning. So what it does, it, get, it does give us an opportunity to weave together this fairly complex, you know, fabric of a lot of different stories, ethnicities, histories, and hopefully it allows almost everyone who visits a facility like this, the ability to find themselves or their own ancestors somewhere in that story. It's, 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 it's the brutality of, of work uh, and the companionship of work. It's the, it's the reaching across cultures and language to uh, create common cause. I mean, it's, it's really a great, a great um, uh, uh, comparison to uh, how the country ought to, ought to function. Peter, um, how many ships do you uh, present? And talk a little bit more about the, the greater facility over at Mystic uh, uh, and how you present that history. Well, let me just kind of slightly pick you up on something you said earlier about the sea shanties, right? Because I've been here seven year, uh, seven months now, Mystic Seaport, and we've changed a few things. And previously to that, I was at Jamestown and Yorktown, so American Revolution and so on. But uh, one of the things we've done is reduce the number of actual sea shanties that we do at the moment and concentrate more on modern day music that's related to the sea. So we have a, people perceive that the museum at Mystic Seaport is a, if you look at all the names underneath Mystic Seaport Museum, kind of Prairie Museum, San Diego Maritime Museum, you don't see the word history. In it. And it's because partly what we're trying to talk about today as much as we're talking about in the maritime history, because what we really want to do is ensure that we engage people today with things that are relevant to them. So our, an example is that uh, we've got to ensure that when a young person comes through the door, 14-year-old African-American girl, for instance, what on earth has Mystic Seaport got to do with her, right? So you've got to try and find that link about what that might have for that individual. So although we have a number of ships and we take it, you know, I've got a replicas of the Draken, which is a Viking ship, and we've got right up to fairly modern ones. And we've also got a maritime uh, sort of marina that people bring the modern day ships into as well. So you can see all those things. We have a certain period where a lot of work was put in to, to set that period around about the 1830s, 1850s. But uh, in reality, we are endeavoring now uh, to really cover a, a large proportion of history and time and look at the relevancy of what, what we're doing with it uh, today, rather than just pick a specific. So we no longer have, for instance, first person uh, performances. We, no one sitting in 2021 and we're not pretending we're anything else. So we've changed it a little bit over the last seven months. And Norman, you you provide, uh, you know, I, I look at your festival of machines, right? So you have this sort of the modern day piece, but you also present uh, the uh, past technologies. We're getting into harvest season and, and uh, Indiana is very much um, guided by the seasons and the growing seasons. Um, how, how do you uh, uh, present? What do you present um, at, so that people can get a real texture for the place that they live and the place that they're visiting? Well, you know, we, we developed as a classical, I guess, uh, first person living history site. As a matter of fact, Prairie Town is coming up on its 50th anniversary in a few years of uh, being one of America's first uh, sites to use first person interpretation on a daily basis. And we have a composite village. It's 1836 Prairie Town. It's not real. It's a composite village and composite characters that we research to be able to tell the story of what the Midwest, specifically Indiana, looked like 20 years after Indiana statehood in, in 1816. Uh, so we have a very large village of, of uh, 18 plus uh, buildings with uh, various uh, families and experiences uh, from an inn to a uh, Cooper woodworking shop to pottery shop to general store to the schoolhouse blacksmith shop, various families, all of those types of things. So that's a core experience. It's always there with first person, but we expanded more than a decade ago into experiential history, beginning to tell the much larger stories. That's why we have an 1859 balloon voyage that actually puts the science and history together, the histemic approach. Uh, that's why we have an uh, immersive site that tells part of the story, uh, or at least Indiana's part of the story uh, of, of the Civil War in 1863. That's an immersive experience with two different immersive theaters with live characters and such to be able to tell those stories. It's why we have trails. It's why we're expanding uh, our property, which actually consists of 1,046 acres and 3.3 miles of river, but we currently pro programmatically only are doing about uh, 60 acres. That's all changing in, in the future. And a big part of our West Campus 
is going to focus on one of the things you just mentioned. How do we talk about agriculture today and in the future? And our food farm and energy experiences on the west side of our property is going to be able to bridge from the historic agriculture that's taking place in Prairie Town and bridging it over to agriculture today and in the future, looking at the river, looking at energy, and looking how we manage our land and, and our water and our energy to make sure that it is abundant for uh, future generations. This, this idea of storytelling is so important. You know, we just took a poll, really interesting. We asked um, how often uh, people have visited Living History Museum in the past 20 years. Uh, and and uh, we, we, we got uh, 10% said once, but, he, but here's the interesting part. In the last 20 years, two to four times, 24% a quarter of our respondents, uh, five to 10 times, um, a third, and more often than 10, uh, also a third. So people are really into this in-person experience. How has the COVID situation affected your ability to tell these stories and to interact? Uh, Raymond, have you have you seen a drop off in in attendance? And um, have you been able to keep people safe during this uh, crazy time that we're living in? Certainly during, you know, during parts of the pandemic, we, we saw a dramatic drop off. We opened and closed four times, you know, in accordance with the instructions of, of you know, the medical authorities. Currently, we're running about the same amount that we were in, in, in 2019. So most of it has recovered. Um, however, I think one, one aspect that all of the institutions represented here have is it can be experienced as primarily outdoor experiences. And it is safer, as we know, to be outdoors where there's plenty of air and ventilation and so forth. And so that's the tendency we've had is to emphasize that. And we, we take about 20,000 people a year out on the water on historic vessels. And that, of course, is really outdoors, you know. So um, that's what we're trying to do as much as we can. For any of the indoor spaces, we, I'm sure as many organizations do, we require people wear masks and keep, you know, safe distance and so forth. And all of our employees have to either be tested or, or uh, vaccinated as well, and they wear masks also. So have we do what we seen, Have you seen much pushback? I, I know there are, there are people who sometimes feel very strongly about those things. Have you been able to navigate it? Because it can be very stressful for people who are just doing their jobs and trying to keep everyone safe when they're confronted. Yeah. It's hardest for frontline people and they experience the same occasional, you know, irate and, and you know, volatile behavior that you hear about in on, in our airplanes and on airports as well. And it is really stressful for them. It seems to be, to me, though, is that the frequency that may be going down, perhaps as a larger proportion of people get vaccinated and, and take this more seriously. Uh, hopefully it's going down and waning. How are things going uh, in, in, uh, in Indiana, uh, Norman? Are, are, are people um, looking at, at, uh, sort of the, the policies that you have with tolerance or, or are you getting a lot of pushback? How's that working? I think we're in a similar um, situation that, that Raymond described. Uh, you know, we, were, we shut down from uh, March 14th through June 16th of last year and then opened back up at 50% capacity. We didn't open our indoor exhibits until June 1st of this year. So we mainly pushed everything, including uh, ticketing to outdoors and, and did that. And and we did have mask requirement and we followed uh, our, our local health department is the one that we have to follow the, the closest, even though obviously we put everything in play. We created uh, an internal uh, system with what we called our COVID connect commander uh, to keep all of our staff trained and, and uh, up, up to speed on that. We did recently last week, we went back to requiring our guests to wear masks inside facilities because of the uptick in Indiana uh, with, with the variant. Uh, and we did get some additional pushback because we've been maskless for quite a while. And, uh, but for the most part, uh, when, when uh, people uh, or perhaps uh, talk about their civil liberties being uh, taken away, we uh, respond uh, very similarly to the way that you did, Mark, uh, earlier in this program, saying that sometimes we have to give up a little bit of that uh, for, the, for the overall betterment of mankind and, and public safety. And, and that will resonate well with some, others it doesn't resonate at all. Uh, I will say that on social media, that for the most part, that uh, our, uh, uh, our base is uh, very, uh, very cooperative. Uh, and if someone is negative, others will explain, hey, they're doing this for the betterment uh, of society and uh, they're a nonprofit educational institution. So 
uh, you need to understand that they're they're following uh, all all protocols and and uh, they're they're looking at that for the safety and health of not only uh, their guests but also their their employees and and their uh, and their volunteers. Sitting with you for a moment, uh, we just got a question about uh, about uh, how we include uh, native and indigenous uh, peoples in the work of the uh, of museums. And frankly, the um, the stunning um, ignorance that that at least I have, um, and that I've that I've been trying for the last couple of decades to correct on um, native history and cultures and and uh, so on, um, is is something that that is promulgated by silence and exclusion, right? And, and it's not done out of uh, necessarily uh, a sense of ill will. It's just uh, often done as in my case, out of, a, out of just a lack of exposure. Um, how do you deal with that um, uh, in Indiana, uh, Norman? Well, uh, of course we do have an 1816 uh, village uh, for the Lenape uh, uh, people. And we actually have the good fortune of having a colleague uh, of ours who uh, is Lenape himself. Uh, and uh, he's able to bring an authentic uh, voice, uh, including the language as well as skills uh, to the site. And uh, we always, we, we kind of place uh, everything that we do, whether it's uh, through the research and interpretation of indigenous people or other, uh, other people other than the first people, because of our uh, diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion, uh, uh, promise statement and action plan, we want to be a place where the doors are always open to a diversity of voices and limitless experiences. So a big part of what we do in developing our programs and research is how do we make these stories inclusive? So that's why I was interested to hear what Peter said, that they've gone completely away from first person interpretation. And we are beginning to look through a new experience master plan on uh, first person interpretation being one of those tools in the toolbox, but not the exclusive tool that we use because we want to be more inclusive. We want to go beyond 1836. So in the future, people might find that uh, that Prairie Town, which used to be just 1836, was founded in 1836. And we're able to tell stories of various eras uh, as a result of that and bring inclusive stories in. That's why our promised land is a proving ground is going to be looking at 500 years of the African-American experience uh, through faith and culture in ways that we could not have done uh, with just 1836 Prairie Town. We're going to be uh, doing more research and look at at the, uh, the Lenape and uh, their forcible uh, removal to our lands in 1795. And then once again, in 1820, due, due to uh, treaties that, um, uh, that our historic family and uh, uh, William Connor was involved with. And those are difficult stories to tell. You wanna talk about authentic history. We, we have it uh, at Connor Prairie. They have it at Mystic Seaport. They have it at San Diego. And we can go down the list of the uh, tens of thousands of historic sites and museums uh, just in, our, uh, in, in America alone that are trying to tell these authentic stories and researching it and doing it appropriately. And that has to be inclusive stories. If we want our history to be relevant, it has to be history that is inclusive of all stories. And we have to tell the good and the bad, and we have to be authentic in those stories. We can't hide it just because of politics. So that it's, it brings us back to this whole discussion of, of storytelling and different perspectives, uh, Peter. When you, uh, we, we just did a poll in which we said, uh, do you believe that living history museums and programs do a good job in general of representing the reality of the era being covered? Um, 71% said living history museums present part of the picture, but inevitably leave certain key, uh, key details uncovered. Have you changed all of you, how uh, these these museums function. I remember I could go to a living history museum, and it, anywhere in the world, and if you if you went to it, and then you went three years later, it would be the same thing. Yeah, you know, you, you might have gone to a different part of the museum, but it would be the same thing. And four years later, after that, same thing. It could have been, you know, and 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 they were so static for so long. But but how have you changed? So that you can tell more stories because you can't all of a sudden snap and change the facility, right? Well, some, some of the issues is it's not just about telling the same things in your museum, but you also tell the same things as another living history museum, right? So you can go and visit a blacksmith in my museum or blacksmith in another museum and see the same work going on, right? So that's what 
we really need to change. Otherwise, you kind of people are saying, well, I'll just go down the road. So when Colonial Williamsburg first started, it was kind of the, the, the new kid on the block and everybody went to it. Now you're getting to a point where people are saying, well, I've seen that. I saw a printer. I've seen a blacksmith. I've seen a, I've seen a, a barrel being made. So we've really got to think about how we change that to be more relevant to those individuals that you've got there. And we're just we're talking about first person. And again, if we did first person, we would do it as a performance. At two o'clock, there's going to be a show where this guy's going to be pretend to be this guy, not people walking around the streets. And here's a good example of how that happens, particularly in a maritime museum. So if somebody walks into our maritime museum and looks at the uh, Charles W. Morgan and sees a ship, people who are in the know might say, oh, a whaling ship, right? But a lot of kids will say, oh, a pirate ship. And a lot of African-Americans will go, oh, a slave ship, right? So you'll look at it from the perspective that you're coming through the door with. So we've really got to make sure that we are informing and telling people in a way that uh, gives uh, the truth and the history behind it. But that's all. You're, you're, you're not going to tell them that they're wrong, right? I mean, that's essentially what, what Raymond did with what me. You, what you're going to do is you're not going to tell them that they're wrong for that particular ship, but you're going to talk about the thing that they're interested in. Okay. Uh, so, I, you know, I've got the Armistad sitting next to the, uh, will it, uh, between the Charles W. Morgan, so I can point in that direction. We can talk about those areas as well. But, you know, we are just... The story with Indigenous people is a really interesting one because I don't think any museum does it particularly well, but, I, but many museums want to do it well. They're committed to trying to do it the best they can. And you really have to be in partnership with the local tribes to understand, to tell their story. Otherwise, you're just telling a generic Indian story, which is like me being an English person coming in and saying the people in Texas and the people in the Indiana are exactly the same as the people in California. And so as an English person, I know that's not the case, right? So you've got to really consider that you're telling their story authentically in their voice. So you, the partnerships is incredibly important. And we at the museum just recently got a, a large grant from a Mellon Foundation to do particularly that, to talk about... Uh, the kind of, I kind of call it the New England lie, this idea that up in New England, we were, they're all abolitionists and didn't touch slavery and that they were really nice to the Indians. So we've got a whole program to start getting that truth and that story coming out over the next few years, leading to a large exhibition. And on the ground, we're trying to tell everybody's story as well, because if you walk through the door, you want a story that connects to you. And if I'm an African-American, do I connect to a whaling museum? Well, actually, a whaling ship? Well, actually, I do, because 25% of people on whaling ships are African-Americans, including a number of captains. We haven't told that story before, partly because we're built in 1929, and that story has really taken a while before it's become the thing to be... To be, to be well, and the, and the irony of, of, uh, of slaves being transported via sea... Uh, to this country to be enslaved and then find uh, finding a measure of uh, within that context of that society of of uh, of uh, independence uh, through um, work as seafarers yeah. um, and empowering that industry um, uh, usually not as enslaved people at that point but as well, a, well a, yeah it's a, it's a meritocracy run a boat right if you know how to navigate you know how to sail the boat, then it doesn't matter what color you are, you're going to be the person doing that because it's important that you don't all drown, right? So there's a meritocracy in there. But there was many cases of whaling ships that have got all black crews going to places like Savannah or New Orleans, having to get off the ship, go to jail for a period of a day while their, their ship was restocked and then coming out of jail and going back on the ship. You see, so, the, those stories and the texture there is so important because it's truth. Yeah, right? So, the, you know, this, this sort of idea of it just being one thing um, and, and uh, having sort of a company storyline that, um, that suppresses the different um, experiences that you're here to reveal um, is, is anathema, isn't it, Raymond? Well, I think so. I think, I, I think one of the things we probably all struggle with, you mentioned that we are all our organizations date back a long way. And the way history was presented for so long is this kind of triumphalist story, you know? And uh, at least it, I think all these organizations, when they had their origins in that, make some attempt to do that. But in fact, that's really not what they've become now because um, museums have evolved now, I think, into these sort of sacred places where all these stories can be told. So for instance, a few years ago, when there was a lot of controversy over the Confederate flag, 
and President Obama said, well, you know, that flag doesn't belong on top of a state house. It doesn't belong in a public square. It belongs in a museum. I think that was a really important comment because what that really does is it establishes the role of museums in dealing with these difficult conversations and dealing with these stories that are not, you know, they're not all happy stories for everyone. Um, a few years ago, we built a replica of a Spanish guy in the San Salvador, which was for more than a century on the West Coast. Uh, that story was accepted as the origin story. Well, of course, it, it really wasn't because there have been people living on the West Coast of the, of, of the Americas for, for 10,000 years or more. So it couldn't be an origin story, but that was the way it was presented. So it makes it difficult and challenging to do something like that and not have it appear to be a triumphalist statement, especially for those people who saw this as the beginning of a horrific tragedy. So coping with that and dealing with that is, again, it's very difficult. But I think if we go back to that idea that museums are the places, one of the few places that we can actually do that and do that where all those conversations can be heard, I think we're all performing a really important role you know, in the ongoing civil discourse that we hope will be more typical of our country than it is at the moment. You know, we just uh, completed the last of our three polls. We're coming to the end of our, our time. So we're going to give uh, Norman the last word. Um, we asked uh, on the value of, of the, the Living History uh, Museum experience, we asked what sort of experience do you value most? And um, 60, 67% said, I like having the museum actively engage in educational experiential programming. This whole idea that you raised, Raymond, that you raised, Peter, of, of, telling different stories of not having a triumphalist uh, um, uh, message of, of looking at the real texture of different experiences, groups and subgroups and sub subgroups and, and how they relate to your various uh, missions is, is so very important. Norman, um, as, as you look at the future of these institutions, how do you see the institutions evolving and what do you think the uh, Connor Prairie Museum and uh, sort of by extension, other living history museums are going to be like in 20 years. Um, uh, comp we know what they were like 20 years ago. We know what they're like today. How do you feel like, uh, how do you feel they will evolve in, in, within the next uh, generation? Well, any good museum needs to meet their audiences where they are. And uh, that's a big part of how we have to evolve as living history museums. Uh, as part of our strategic plan back in 2018, we created an aspirational goal to change the way the world views and uses museums. Now, that sounds like a very aspirational goal for one museum, uh, but we saw that as being part of a larger museum community, not being singular as a living history museum uh, or an art museum or a science center or a children's museum. No museum should see themselves as singularly because we are an asset for our communities and we should engage and, and make sure that our audiences can experience everything about history with authentic stories. So a big part of how Connor Perry is evolving is once again, looking at the different ways that we can engage our audiences, the different tools that we can use beyond uh, even just physical characters uh, and engage our audiences in these stories and dialogues that we have. Uh, museum theater has been one of the tools in our toolbox for a while, and we've done that very successfully. And I think we'll continue to do that, uh, not only physically on the site, but we're beginning to evolve to that virtual stage. Uh, changing the way the world views and uses museums became a little bit easier, I'll say, during COVID, because we all launched in big ways virtual platforms that gave us an extended audience that we didn't have locally before. And for us to say that as uh, museums that we should go back to the way it used to be is not true. That's why we call what we're doing now the business of the unusual, because we'll never do business as usual again. We're doing the business of the unusual. And that's what I think Connor Prairie, Mystic Seaport, all of these other museums are gonna have to do. We have to meet the audiences where they are. And if they wanna be engaged a certain way, then we're going to evolve that way, way with our audience. We can't be set in our ways the way many living history museums have been in the past. Well, I feel like I've benefited from the education that you have all provided uh, to me. Thank you so much for, for making the points. Um, Peter Armstrong, President and CEO of Mystic Seaport Museum of Connecticut. Uh, I, I love some of the uh, texture that you provided me. I mean, I feel like I, I've been sitting in a um, in a living history uh, class benefiting. Come and visit, Mark. Come and visit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> 
I will be there. And, and the same for you, Norman, president and CEO of, Conop- of the Conopuri Museum. And uh, Raymond Ashley, president and CEO of the Maritime Museum of San Diego. It's been a while since I've come visited. Um, I will be down there as soon as I possibly can. And, and perhaps we can have a cup of coffee together. Thank hey, you all so much. Hey, <laughs> and, and, and thank your board, your volunteers that keep those ships running, that keep yeah. your facilities going. Um, they're just so wonderful. Thank your funders. Uh, and, and thank you. Everybody stay safe and mask up if you can. Find your way to a vaccination station. Let's open this economy up. Take care, all. Thank you. Bye.